pregnant or pregnant. All right, we're about to begin the curriculum and instruction meeting committee. <laughs> <laughs> and I will now turn it over to Ms. Moriarty. Good afternoon, everybody. Our first resolution this afternoon, uh, item 1.101, is a resolution to uh, approve Susan Torres Bender to go to the 21st Century uh, Annual Conference in Albany. She is our coordinator for 21st Century. Okay. Yes. Are there any, I was waiting for that to come back up. <laughs> Are there any questions or comments? Thank you. Okay, great. Our next item 1.02 is a resolution to approve a field trip request for New Windsor School for their entire grade one to go to the Bronx Zoo in May. Are there any questions or comments? Great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next resolution, item 1.03, is a resolution to approve a contract with Zycra, um, which is a company that uh, monitors the payment for Medicaid uh, loss and prevention and billing services. And if here to talk about it is Mr. Bayer. Question? Yeah, uh, we talked about that. Would you like to let me describe their services? So Zycra is been working with Newburgh for many, many years. Um, they're uh, located at New Falls, they're local. Um, they manage the full range of responsibilities around the Medicaid billing process. Um, we, a number of all of our related services folks have to provide daily logs on the students they see. And there's very clear parameters uh, for how those logs need to be done. She provides, she over, does the oversight of those logs. She creates the uh, the reports that have to go to um, the state agency that reviews them. She has to make corrections along the way. She has to monitor um, some related services folks that might be not timely and make sure they get their notes in on time. And we've learned in the past, we had one uh, person who worked with us who had a hard time with that. She would constantly be vigilant, sending our related services folks emails when they're not timely to make sure that we're in compliance. She provides annual training to all our related services folks, which is required by law, and she helps create the annual uh, compliance report that is required by state law because of how much we bill it. And she takes a component, she takes a piece of the overall uh, paper we get to see. And what is the piece that she takes? This is um, obviously goes by how much she generates back for the district. What is the piece that she gets? It's 10% of the overall remittances and, and reimbursements. So we could not come up with just a flat fee. It has to be a percentage of what comes in? No, because it does range. Um, there's some differences year to year depending on how many students you have in the system, how many students get uh, our, she has to, and also there's just, you also know there's annual reports that come out. I'm sorry, there's quarterly reports that come out from the Medicaid side that we have to connect to the students in the district. So we we put logs in for every student. She has to connect the dots. So Chris Bayer might have Medicaid. My my mom might have let it lapse. She has to make sure those students are taken out of the roles or put back in the roles. And the, so it's a very elaborate process. So it is, it's really fair to her that because some years can be more complex than others that she does do it based on the amount that she brings back. And it does incentivize her to make sure that we, we you know, maximize our aid. Um, and that's why she stays on top of it. She has done this and she is, is another piece why she's important to us. We had a Medicaid um, audit a few years back and it was, they said we had one of the best processes for Medicaid. Uh, we have one smaller detail that cost us about a thousand dollars to fix. Some districts will go through these audits. Sometimes they have to give back to state 40, 50, 60 million dollars. Um, to state was very pleased with our Medicaid process and feel that she's uh, was well worth her money. So, um, so that's why there's there's the percentage of the overall. It incentivizes her to make sure we do this and maximize our aid. Does anybody have any other questions or comments? 
Yes, Thank you, Mr. President. Bear. That, that answered some of my questions. My my first question is, she is worth the money. No, I mean, we we get more back in from Medicare recoupment than we would without her. Yes. Thank you. That's awesome. Any other questions for Connie? Okay. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Farrell for the secondary items. Thank you, Ms. Moriarty. Um, we have several resolutions. Uh, the first involved uh, conference request. Uh, Ms. Coyne, uh, transportation coordinator. Ms. Peterson, assistant superintendent, chief information and data officer. Ms. Cloy, registration, Dr. Cloy, excuse me, registration. And two um, individuals from the NTC uh, Newburgh Teacher Center attending appropriate conferences and Ms. Lazarski, food service. Um, all of their budget areas are identified as well as the um, scope of the conference and the dates. Are there any questions on any of those? Any questions or comments? I, I don't have any. I don't know. Thank you. Um, our next item um, are involved field trips for students. The first is from NFA, and this is coming out of CTE. It is a welding auto construction department trip. Uh, the fee for this uh, transportation cost is provided by Lincoln Ted, going to Mawa. The second is an ROTC trip, um, which is supported federally. They will be going to Medford, New Jersey. The next is varsity baseball team. This is an invitational trip to Portland. Um, there are a number of baseball teams that were invited to participate in a uh, semi-regional um, activity this spring. This is an overnight trip and there are three teachers attending. The next is a wonderful opportunity for our Italian study students at West, uh, NFA West. They will be going to the opera. They're going to see Don Giovanni. That is a fabulous opportunity for these students. The next one, uh, boys track team, I would like to pull. And if I may come back to that, I can explain why. And the last item is the girls track team. Um, 10 students and two teachers going to uh, University of Pennsylvania. That is also an invitational track team, which they attend regularly. Are there any questions on any of those other than the one I'm asking to pull? Yes, Madam President. I really like your comments. They really help. <laughs> Thank because, you. you know, you look at the kids going, but in the administrative content, it really helps to, mm -hmm. to see why they're going. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, so yes. are you going to talk yes. about that now? Yes. Oh, okay. That's okay. All right. um, I had asked for additional information about the boys track team. Uh, there are 15 students, one teacher and two parents. I asked for additional information on the two parents how they were selected, why parents were going, and why not another school chaperone, and I have not gotten that response yet. Um, they're not going, this is not scheduled till April. If I get the information, I'd be happy to bring it back in March. If I don't get the information, um, I won't bring it back in March, unless the committee directs me to do so. So, okay, so, like, pen relay, pen relay, one of the biggest relays annually for our kids, so. Yep. Are we going to try to make sure that those boys are able to participate, yes. not just wait for a letter or a no, response? No, I, I have actively okay. asked for the information, okay. and I will continue to do so. Yes, Madam President. And please check and make sure that our students are in good standing and are on oh, our yes. roster. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions or comments? Okay. The next item authorizes the superintendent to execute a contract with com custom computer specialist. Uh, this is for software that um, allows Infinite Campus, which is our student data repository, part of our student data repository, to integrate and to print uh, specific reports and materials. Is that correct, Ms. Peterson, or did I misspeak? <laughs> a little different. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank I was, I was, I was cringing a little. 
So MPIC campus workflow, um, the data department, the security department, the technology department really, have been exploring how we use our internal systems when it comes to scholarship. Scholarship is something that we're seeing from the vendor and they're starting to scale back services. Um, so in response to the scale back of services that we noticed at the beginning of this year, we started to explore how are we going to supplement replace, what are we going to do to make sure that operationally we can do the same things? Um, and this uh, Campus Workflow Suite is, in, is a program that integrates with our current student management system that would be more beneficial to the district. So instead of having two systems, we would have one system. So this is actually going to assist us with a pilot this year where we're able to use our current systems, our current software, our current um, hardware, so there's scanners, different things that we have purchased under scholarship, we are able to integrate those into MP campus. So what our plan is, is to purchase the software and pilot it so that we are also ready for the fall as we transition scholarship out and put workforce week. So this will give us the space, it will start in March, um, and we will use it this school year and then also implement it in summer school and it shouldn't be operationally any changes for the buildings. So it's not as if you are purchasing a whole brand new system. This is kind of not so much an upgrade, but it will work with the current system that you have, which is why you want to get this particular software. It will work with the current hardware that I currently have. So I'm not going to be purchasing new scanners. I'm not going to be purchasing printers or new tablets. There's certain things that come with scholarships. There's mm -hmm. kiosks and tablets. Those things will work with Infinite Campus. What we're finding when we're interacting with scholarship, there was a lot of things that they told us that they were doing. And I think from the uh, informational technology standpoint, their company hasn't been successful. For instance, they used to print our badges. This year, they said, we can't print badges, you have to print badges. So if I'm already doing this amount of work, I would prefer to have a program mm -hmm. or a software program that integrates with my current student management system. And that's what I'm looking to do. Okay, so that's what, that's what I'm saying. It's not like you are purchasing a whole brand new something. It's to complement what you have. Correct. It's okay. A software program. Right. Okay. Yes, Madam President. Um, Is this... Folding is what I'm going to call it. Mm -hmm. Is it as you, easy to use as scholarship was? It is going to be, but it's also, I for me, I think integration is going to be better because it's aligned with our student management system. Scholarship was outside of our student management system and had to integrate in. This is our student management systems. And where are you piloting? We are going to pilot it. Um, we, we haven't talked to the principals about which building. Okay, then don't say anything. Well, yet. Well, yeah, not yet. We, we had to get through this first step, but it's not planned to start until early March. Um, we have mentioned it to them. They have seen it. One but, building, two buildings. Well, depending on how one building goes, there might be two buildings that we're going to do. And this is going to be 6-12? Um, it is going to be high school for the pilot, 9-12, and then it's also going to be ESYB. And, but this eventually will be 6-12? Yes, eventually it will be 6-12. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Our next item involves uh, a proposal um, for planetarium repair. As you know, we have not been able to use our planetarium facility effectively um, because it needed upgrades and repair work done. Uh, this will bring us back into compliance and we should be able to use the planetarium in March. Um, our director of science, uh, Mr. Romano, has activities planned for both community outreach and students as well as a visit by an astronaut. Um, so it's essential that we can get this work done in a timely manner. And I'm happy to say we have a reasonable hope for that. Any questions or comments? Yeah. Yes, Ms. Howard. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, planetarium, wow. It goes back to when I was in school. I'm not gonna date myself, mm -hmm. but are upgrades the answer here or refurbishing and re just doing and bringing something up to date? Because I gotta say that, that planetarium is at least 50 years old. At least, yes. So, 
The, is this something that we're going to fix now and have to fix again in a couple of years? Uh, and, Mr. Romano believes that if we do this piece of the repair, we will be good to go for a good many years. I don't want to put a time frame on it, but we should not have to make, if we do regular maintenance um, and treat our equipment with respect, we should not have to do upgrades um, of a costly manner in the foreseeable future. He thinks we're good to go for another 40, 50 years. But I, but I will, you know, there's no guarantees on that, but that was what we believe. Structurally, some, yeah. uh, structurally mm -hmm. yes, there were just some in, integral pieces that needed to be replaced. Thank you. Yes, Madam President. I love the planetarium, yeah. and I'm glad that it's going to come back online for for our staff, our kids, and for our staff too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they really, the science teachers really were excited about that. Mr. Romano has plans to have the kids coming back on field trips on a regular basis yeah. once we can get going. It's a great program. Mm -hmm. it works. Um, Any other questions or comments? Just, just a comment on the proposal. I'm, I'm thrilled we're doing things like this, but. On a proposal, is there a way to tighten it up? You, you mentioned we're time sensitive, mm -hmm. but his proposal doesn't indicate that. It's very open ended. Yes, you're right. Um, I certainly will look into that in the future and see if we can do that in a more forthright manner. Okay. Thank you. That's a good suggestion. Thank you, sir. Any other questions or comments? Um, our next piece is. And I'm very happy, not that I'm not happy to bring you the other pieces, <laughs> but um, we are able, hopefully able to go forward with establishing our flag football program for our girls, um, 9 through 12. Um, this establishes two coaching positions at the varsity level, a girls head coach and a girls assistant coach. Uh, this position is aligned to the girls varsity lacrosse coaching positions and follows the same salary schedule. I believe it's Schedule J, the backup material is there. Um, we have, um, and I have material to share with you. Um, this is um, a copy of the schedule. Thank you. Um, it will be, that the girls will be following. Um, also a prototype of the uniforms. Uniforms have been, uh, the sketch has been approved by the JETS organization. Um, the uniforms have had preliminary audits placed. Um, assuming that we go forward with our coaching positions, um, we will have tryouts on March 13th, and hopefully um, have our coaches in place, have um, interest from our girls. Um, Ron Jackson, as our interim athletic director, has had conversation with many of our female athletes already, and is also talking to. Um, some folks who had expressed preliminary interest in perhaps applying for the coaching positions. This is a state recognized sport by the New York State Association, which is why we do not have to actually create the team. We just have to assume the coaches. Um, and there are a number of districts um, within our section who will be participating. The NFL has been a driver in this activity. Um, not only because it's very good public relations for them, mm -hmm. but it is also part of the NFL initiative to involve more women in uh, sports that are not typically uh, female dominated or female participation. Um, we will be receiving some funding from the Jets, um, who is our assigned team, not the Giants, just the Jets. Mm -hmm. um, and the girls will get to play a game at the Meadowlands. Mm. So when, when that game comes around, if you are interested in getting passes, please let me know. Mm -hmm. Because, yes. I have, I have some question. Um, has a survey gone out to the girls to see how many are interested? Ms. Jackson's in the process of doing that. Good. Mr. Harrison and I, had forgotten that, but he didn't get to I see the nice long list of participating yes. uh, school districts, and that's really nice. I really like this for girls because I think it gives another opportunity. My only holdback is, wouldn't Schedule J be a negotiated item? Doesn't this have to go to the NTA for negotiation? Of course, um, I spoke with Mr. McElmore. He didn't believe so. Um, it is, I believe, bringing it to personnel committee also, okay. which I believe the date has been changed tomorrow. No, we have something today. Today, we have something instead of, right. Um, 
but because it was an existing schedule and it was aligned, it was an additional position. And my understanding is that the NTA did not have an objection to that. Good, thank you. If, that, they, that if would... they do, I will be happy to sit and negotiate. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, the last item um, I had before we have our guest presentation, um, we are hosting some championships uh, starting this Friday, um, which I wanted to share the information with you on that. And yeah. um, we also, and I do not have the final information for you today, but it will be going up to the board and um, hopefully give you an update at our board meeting on the 14th. Um, we are also hosting the kickoff for Special Olympics on February 15th, and that will be at Maine. Um, if we're starting, I believe it's 9 o'clock in the morning and running through <laughs> to about 1 o'clock. Um, we do have students on campus that day. Um, we started work on this uh, the beginning of November, so we have the space identified. Uh, we're just finishing up the touching pieces on the protocols. The last piece I have is we had discussed um, one or two meetings ago um, honors versus non honors courses, and um, I took the information that I had shared with you at that time, we had shared with you rather, I'm sorry, at that time, and put it in a non educator user friendly format um so that it was a little bit clearer than the format that we had received prior to this and if anybody has any questions about um, where we have our honors programs and where we do not have honors programs and the weighting courses um i'm happy to you know respond to them now or in the future any questions or comments? Yes, Madam President. I'm going to need a little time to digest this data, sure. and then I'll make questions when you know, right. it's time with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that includes our, um, uh, well, I, uh, excuse me, we have an e rate for internet service update, and I will ask Ms. Peterson to address that if that's okay, Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you. So I just wanted to also bring up the discussion of e rate. I actually think that I might have to do the resolution because I did get. Um, the information back from our service provider. So for um, every year, um, E-Rate is a program that is provided by the U.S. Department of Federal Complete Trades Commission. And what it does is it allows libraries and schools to enter into discounted internet services, as well as it gives a need for qualifying districts um, to better support their internet structure, broadband, and, and different things. So we go through a yearly process of applying um, and bidding for our internet services. We were up for bid this year. Um, we did get back our rate that would need to be approved because it goes into effect July 1. So I can bring that on to the next board meeting. And we're in the process now of bidding out our project. Usually uh, the E-rate project usually has to do access points or uh, we identify different projects. We've been doing access points throughout the district. So if we look up all these little new boxes when you go to buildings, um, it allows our broadband to be accessible for teaching and learning. Um, and I think we're going to extend that to make sure that everything is refreshed. So I just wanted to give you guys an update of where that is at. Um, and I may need to bring a resolution to approve the new rate for July 1. I have a question. Is this going to improve the connection rate? Because in some schools in this district, the connection is horrible. I, I wanted to say it the way I feel. It's horrible. So is this going to improve it? Because in some buildings, it's hard to connect to the internet when you're in there. So right. is this going to improve it? So I've been hearing about that horrible rate. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's actually interesting because when I do a survey of my, and I just did one of the largest buildings in the district, mm -hmm. there's some places where we're better than hospitals. So there may be connectivity issues in certain buildings because of infrastructure, but the broad written is in. Okay. It could be a, a device issue. It could be a network issue. So what me and my team have been doing, and I actually am going to PD my team next week, uh, my text around 
how do we do network surveys in buildings? I've been doing as asked. So if I have an issue, for instance, we're, we're exploring different computer-based initiatives, different things in the district. So before that is done, the state requires that I do a, what we call a heat map of my internet mm -hmm. in each building. When I do that, my heat map show that I have great service within the building. Now, mm -hmm. cell service and internet service are two different things. Mm -hmm. So I could have a building that has great broadband, has great broadband, has has the, the internet accessibility, the teachers have access, but my cell phone couldn't work because I could know one building in particular. Mm -hmm. I have no cell coverage, but if I open my laptop and we're in that building, my laptop is going to work. Okay. So there's different things. So I'm also trying to bring that awareness okay. to what it what it is. Um, sometimes these little boxes go out. So that's also what the site survey tells me. The site survey tells me, hey, you have a, a box issue and you need to repair that. Right. So my teams have been going around. I think we've done three or four. We got new software for to allow us to mm -hmm. do that. Um, so my team has been learning that and we will continue to do those site surveys. What the E-rate allows us to do, it allows us in the summertime to say, this building, this entire building needs new access boxes. Mm -hmm. And then the day to day or the month to month is if this box goes, how do my internal district text replace the box? So that's what e -read. Okay, thank you. Any, Mr. Howard? Yeah, so which service is responsible for the walkie talkies that are security users? That was a, that's a whole, that's a, a different question. I can get back to you on that one because I'm not sure if they're using via voiceover protocols because we have a lot of different communication protocols. Our phones, our walkie-talkies, so I can talk to Mr. Tindall to figure out what software that they're using. Um, our phone system is also on our internet system, so I'm not sure what they're using, but I can get back to you on that. Yeah, I think that's important. Okay. I, I've, I've been in a situation with a, a AP in the building who was trying to get through, and we were there for 10 minutes for a response. Right. And that's a safety issue. Right. And that, and that is when I, when I talk, we have our buildings, they, they built them tough. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and some of our buildings, in terms of different access, like a cell phone or a walkie-talkie, it's different, that emits different waves, right? So we have different communication waves. So a walkie-talkie and a cell phone is very different than a computer. So we have, may have building that that may not be an access, that may be a different device I can use. So I'll work with Mr. Tindall to see what he's using yes. and what, what shortfalls we, we can correct. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Okay, our next update item is an update from Mr. Rotaco, our new director of math. Um, as you're aware, we've been highlighting a director in a content area each month. And this afternoon, we will hear from Mr. Rotaco. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. And thank you for the invite. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, just updates with mathematics um, that I've seen throughout the year and the direction that, that we are going. Um, I want to start off with the First slide as a um, New York State mathematics learning standards. As you know, we're moving to the next generation learning standards. We have been and we will continue up with Algebra 2. So an update, I just changed this slide out yesterday because it was updated, I believe, as late as late last week, that the um, next gen New York State came down and basically said because there is a strong alignment with mathematics, with the Common Core and the next generation learning standards, that we don't need an overlap of regions time. So with that being said, state came down and said the last administration of the Algebra One Common Core regions will be January of 2024, next year. And the first administration of the next generation learning standards algebra exam will be in June, 2024. And that will follow suit the same with geometry and algebra two, there will be no overlap of regions exams with Common Core and Next Generation Learning Standards. So that's the biggest update with that one. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, um, about two weeks ago, and well, since the beginning of the year, really, these pig photos were taken about two weeks ago. I was very excited, and I'm always excited to be a part of the uh, fifth grade math meets where we take um, nine students from every elementary school, and they're placed on nine different teams. And uh, nine students from one, there is no student on one team that are in the same elementary school. So the kids are all 
mixed up on different teams. I was there at the very first meeting where they introduce everyone's shy and, and a little scared to talk to each other. They come up with their name and their logo and everything that they're going to do. And then they start to compete. We did a couple of practice rounds. This was taken two weeks ago, I believe, from the uh, third meet. And it was very interesting to see over just two meets how confident these students have become. I love to see them working, collaborating, using each other and using their mathematical strategies to solve difficult fifth grade math problems with fidelity and compete. And it was a lot of fun. Cookies were excellent. They're fed. The kids are having a blast. And we have one more final one, I believe, on February 15th. And that's going to be here at the board in the auditorium with an escape room. And I've been asked to do uh, one of the um, stations myself, and I can't wait to get involved. So that's... Uh, we should extend an invite to the board members because it is a really amazing event to see them yes. in the culmination of the activities. I, I, I actually attended one of the events over to Arnold. I was thoroughly impressed yeah. and uh, I was curious. So it's a fifth grade team. Is anything done one through five or one through four to encourage kids? This is uh, to promote that the math teams and what doing good in math can lead to as, as in a sport. You, you look to be a part of the varsity mm -hmm. team and to be more inclusive. Is there anything that we can do or the district can do to get kids more interested in math not, or not normally interested in math, but we know it being interested in math leads to going further in school and after school. Are we doing anything in the one through four area to promote that? That's an excellent suggestion. Um, it's done through AIS teachers in every building. I can check with them to see what they're doing currently. I can give you an answer once I find out what, what they are doing to promote this. I was, I was blown away when I went over there. I, I got to tell you, yeah, I came. I, I believe I came back and I spoke to the superintendent about it. You know, I was so impressed with kids at that age level to be able to communicate and, and solve exactly. problems and, 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 and actually articulate yeah. the work. It was incredible. Mm -hmm. it was incredible. And have fun. And have fun at the same time. Yes, yeah, they were having a blast. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so when I first came in, as all good math people do, the first thing I did when I got access to a data system is I downloaded whatever I could to see uh, what needed help, what we were good with, um, areas of concern, areas of weakness. And what I discovered pretty quickly on was um, looking at extended and constructed response questions. And I believe I was looking at grade uh, six or seven at first. And it was proportionally low with the amount of, um, or high rather, shall I say, of the amount of students that are getting zeros, zero points across these extended response questions. That's pretty much uh, grades three through eight, book three, day two rather. And then on the readings exams, it's the part two, three, and four. Now, these are questions that are not multiple choice. These are questions where they're asked to show their work, asked to explain their reasoning as to draw pictures, as to do things of that nature, graph things. So anything with a response and an extension on it, they're often worth more points, and we are getting far less points that we're getting on multiple choice. So there is a good amount of points to be earned on these questions. I'm gonna explain this graph in one second. So multiple choice, you either get it right or you don't, no matter what you show, no matter what you say, it's either a two point questions that you're receiving or it's zero. With these extended response, regardless of it's a, a two points, six points, whatever it might be, you can still gain one point. And oftentimes, I don't want to say low hanging fruit, but if you kind of answer the question, you can justify a point. So I feel like our students are really losing a lot of ground here by not. I don't know if they're not attempting. I could find out if they're blank or not, but. So sorry, this is this is something worth digging into. So I did a little more. I downloaded all the data, and uh, this chart is aggregated by um, segregated by course versus. This is where it gets complicated. Course on the bottom, and on the side, I averaged. I averaged the per question um, amount of students that are getting zero. So in other words, on average, let's say there are ten questions and I'm making this up on the grade three exam that are extended response. On average, across those 10 questions, 
about 49, I don't know if you can see that number, it's 48.72, that's about 49% of our third grade students are not scoring any points. Now that doesn't mean across all 10, it means on average per question. And that's our best grade as of last year's data. So our best grade performed district average, about 50% of our students in their best grade are not scoring any points per question on average. And as you can see, grade four, we did worse on grade five, a little worse, grade six, a little worse, grade seven, we did a little better at 53, but not quite grade three. If you look at grade eight, that's 80% of our kids on average scored zero points per question. Um, and then high school is not great either. We have a 66%, we have a 72% and a about a 76% for algebra two. So our students are struggling with these extended response questions where we can really gain a lot of points and really up our scores if we can just focus on this a little more. Let me just add one data point before that. So just please know with grade eight, um, years past, I don't know how far back, I'm, I'm trying to find this out now, at least last year, our grade eight algebra one common core students did not sit for the grade eight math exam. So often these are our top students who are not sitting for the grade eight exam. This year they are going to sit, so hopefully those numbers will live for grade eight. Yes, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I have a question. I'll, I would, are you done? Uh, I could, yeah. All right. Can questions. I ask on, yes. just on this slide? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's a fourth to fifth grade slide in math, and it gets worse in fifth grade and sixth grade and seventh grade. What are we doing to address that slide? That's what I'm going to get. Thank you for asking. I'll move to the next slide. Do you have a question also? I did have a question. So, you explained something that was very interesting in regards to where we're getting those zeros and where we're not getting that effort there. So obviously, and, and like I was talking to some kids recently that were taking a test with multiple choice. There's, there's a skill set there. You, you got to know that one's, one's a ridiculous answer and, and you narrow it down. There's a, there's a skill set of how to take a test. Do we teach our children how to take a test, i.e. what you just said in regards to doing some of that work and trying to get one out of the two points. Do we teach that? Or do we just let kids take tests and look at the data and then be dumbfounded by the data when actually you got to have to teach kids how to take mm -hmm. tests correctly? And that, might that answers part of my question. Okay. But mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry. And from where I come from in Yonkers, it's not so much that they are taught to take the test. They just show them how to solve the problems in the class. Some of it is reading skills. Some of them don't even understand what the question is asking. So if they get confused about what it is they're supposed to do, they tend to bypass it. And I know that firsthand for a fact. Now, for some of the students that can possibly read what the question is because all of those are open-ended questions, which means they have to read. You, you just can't go in and crunch numbers. You have to be able to read the problem. So if they do read it and they kind of understand it, as long as they make an attempt, people, they will try to find you the points. But the kids who bypass it completely, I personally think it's because they didn't understand what the question was. So they need to get through how to read the questions and, and that is taught in class and in the past some of our good teachers are really super teachers have used the vocabulary of their subject matter right to be able to prepare students it's not preparing them to take the test right but it's preparing them to look at and see what they need to do to, to answer the exactly test. exactly which which leads me to another question as we see and we we talk about early literacy Mm -hmm. you learn to read and you read to learn. Some children aren't able to read on the level and read those questions. Mm -hmm. We have kids. I've heard, we, I, I've heard that we have high school students reading on for third, second grade reading levels. Yes. So if we have third and fourth graders taking tests where it's important to read and interpret and understand what they're reading and they can't read, there's a bigger problem. Yes. yes. Correct. You are 100% correct. They also need to understand the grading and how they're grading and the rubric of how they're graded. Mm -hmm. So we do have seen a shift, and Mr. Rotaco can support this, I'm sure, too, and, and Marcy. 
when we're giving formative and summative assessments in the classroom to have the rubric and they understand they're exchanging papers, they're grading each other, they're giving feedback. And I think that's what Mr. Ritaka was saying. If they understand, if you put something down on the paper that applies to the question, you're going to get a point. It's going to be better than a zero. Mm -hmm. So demonstrate any piece of understanding that you had pulling that question apart. So, I think Mr. Wataka is going to go into greater detail about that, but I think it's okay. really important that they understand how it's scored and graded. And, and but that vocabulary will help with that. Absolutely, yes. 110 percent. Like even in science, mm -hmm. we can do the same thing. Yep. And social studies, you teach the vocabulary Absolutely. that they need to be able to, to use the tools that we're using. Exactly. Next slide, please. So the two questions I asked myself as soon as I looked at this, and I said, well, are we aware of this in this district? And um, are students actually being exposed to these types of questions? Um, as a classroom teacher years ago, when I saw that I had a problem with this initially, it was a matter of exposure. So I needed to expose my students to this type, these types of problems for them. So they're used to it, they know what to do. I can teach them the strategies, the vocab, what to look for in order to do certain things. I don't know. I'm brand new here. I, it was two weeks that I've been here that, that, that I uncovered this. All right, so I went out and I did many classroom walkthroughs with colleagues by myself um, during my classroom observations, discussions with teachers, discussions with principals and building administrators. And it supported my thought that I'm not seeing students being exposed a whole lot in math classes to these types of questions. Now, I'm seeing a variety of things, but I'm not seeing these please explain your answer type of questions or within the realm of how the state puts it. So, okay, so that's that's good because if no one's exposing their kids, we can we can do that. We can easily do that, and that can definitely make a difference. So, and as we know, like I just stated, by increasing the exposure, it will help the students to develop mathematical thinking. It'll help the vocabulary. We can work with the students to dissect the problem and what that means. And overall, we'll get our, our test res results will be better. So next slide, please. Okay, so I'm in the middle of this phase right now. Um, I took the raw exam data, the same data that I had in this big, ugly spreadsheet, and I met with teachers, uh, NFA teachers particularly, other subgroups that come through at some time. I've done this work with principals. I've done this work with assistant principals. And I gave them the raw data and we did an activity where we looked through it and he said, okay, let, let's find some, some things. Just find something that you're proud of, find something that we can work on. And I love doing these activities with stakeholders because we always find something that maybe I didn't think of. And it always takes the group in the direction that we wanna go towards a solution. And we came up with some really, really cool things. Hey, I, you know, I didn't realize that we do so well in this area. I thought we did better here, but we don't. Um, you know, in my particular class, how do you teach it? And then we get the organic conversations that happen. Okay. Then I show them my data, which the slide that I showed you all. And the initial shock is over. Nobody could believe that it was that bad. Um, but there's definitely a need that that's the push. That's the push that we're going to go to. From there, some principals have reached out to me and said, hey, can I have that disaggregated from my particular school? Absolutely. So I disaggregated. I'm still in the process of doing that for every single building. And I'm meeting with principals. I've met with probably half the principals so far with their individual data statistics. And I'm coming up with individual action plans with uh, school building leaders. And I'm meeting with teacher teams as per that and everything else. And we're exposing this data. Every time I meet, anytime I see anybody related to math, this is the conversation that we're having. We need to expose kids more to this type of thing. Okay, how did we do that? Let's come up with some strategies. So this is turning into a, it's turning into a, it's growing legs, as they say. This is growing legs and um, students are now being exposed a little bit more. It's getting asked to be put on their uh, lesson plans that principals are receiving and then looking for extended response, readings, questions, you name it. Um, Principals are asking me to come in and meet with the individual teachers on PLCs. Some principals are asking for individual question breakdowns, which is perfectly fine, and that's good. And I'm working with teachers and teacher teams and building administrators on how we can support this initiative that, that I'm pushing through here. I have a, a question. Yes. 
they should be using um, tests from prior years because once the tests have been given, they can use those same test questions exactly. in class. So my thing is, hopefully they have still the test because yeah. oh. they, so they should be using the prior tests mm -hmm. as a basis for them to teach the kids the same thing because those prior tests come in handy. All of these tests are publicly available. Yes. It's just a cool okay. search away. Yep. So high school teachers are well aware of that. They have that. Uh, middle school but I'm just wondering, are they using them as the question? And that's what I'm pushing. Them. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so we want them using actual state questions and even okay. questions that they can take that are not and level them up. Right. Okay, now that you saw this, explain it to me. Verbally explain it to me. Okay. So this is, this is the, but yes, you're spot on with that. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Next slide, please. <laughs> so that's the action that I am. Um, that's one question. What are we doing for the students where this is correct. it's not the math the problem, the reading is the problem? Where do they go? Well, we're also working with teachers on the, that are the posing AIS. questions on, I don't really understand how to teach these strategies. So I look at my first grader at home and I see what she's doing. And she's coming in and she's circling certain words that she doesn't understand. She just learned to read. And she's still circling, oh, this says more. So that means I'm adding. So there's a little strategy that we're doing in class like that. It's not foolproof, but it's a step in the right direction. Part of the academic intervention service support that they get to, throughout the day as well. Yeah, the, the AIS. Okay. Yes. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Two things. One, you're going to run out of time because we do have a 3.30 meeting. So I still haven't heard an answer to my question. What are we going to do to fix that fourth to fifth grade slide, which is critically important? And number two, how can we encourage our minority students and our ENL students to uh, participate in higher level math? Uh, the higher level courses and how and and math uh, the math team because when you go and see the math team you can visually see that it's not the same ratio proportionately of our uh, the way our district is uh, so I think that's something that really needs to be addressed and it needs to be addressed soon okay so I will put a focus on the fourth and fifth absolutely and that's uh the first grade after third, those questions are readily available, like I said, so I'm going to give a push for that. Fourth and fifth, so. We also have the elementary math TOSA, Mr. Ryan Brady, yes. who has been going in doing walkthroughs, working within the classroom, side by side coaching, modeling, um, and the teachers are signing up for his support across the district to come in and, and work with him. So that has been a huge gain over the last two years. Well, the test scores will count. Hopefully so. We're looking forward to it. One of the other pieces that um, might help as we move forward, it will not be an immediate fix, but we're looking to include some of our CTE programs at the middle school level and over summer school also. And many of those are careers that focus and use math and science extensively as a workplace asset. Um, as we move those forward, it is my hope that in subsequent years, we begin to introduce career stands also at the elementary level, three, four, and five, um, that will also um, perhaps assist in developing a greater interest in the mathematical sciences. Can yes, I? So, Madam Chair, so we are pressed for time here. So I'll get with you in between the meetings and maybe you can get with uh, Dr. Kate because I'm not casting for but I don't know if you really didn't understand the question, but there was a specific specific question being asked, and you didn't address it. So, but but we'll we'll talk about that. Maybe I'm not preparing the question correctly. What question was that? What, what, what question was it? What question? Minority participation mm -hmm. in high level math and mm -hmm. getting kids at an early age to understand the importance of math. Because when you go, like I said, I was impressed with the math, but. I saw maybe three or four African Americans in there, or more some Latinos, but th that's not reflective of our district. And what can we do to get young children interested in these high level maps or being a part of these type of programs? I have a response programs. to that, but we'll talk. Yeah, right that's now. what I'm saying. We don't have the time right now, but that was the question. Understood. I'm sorry. My apologies. No, no problem. And we're going to ask that question to everybody. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. No, no, no. no. Yeah. It's that's a, something that yeah. has to be in the forefront of our thinking all the time for mm -hmm. every course is every every mm -hmm. curriculum Absolutely. every subject matter okay am i i can continue or am i 
or we're pressed for time. Oh, well, we are we are pressed for time, but you 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 can you can. Why don't you wrap? Okay, okay, so I'll wrap it up with common assessments. So um, we're rolling common assessment out. We did this year with uh, we're doing seven at the elementary level throughout the year, and four. Uh, one per quarter with elementary and regions to also support the work that I was just speaking about. What happens is after these common assessments are given, it's a little easier for the secondary because we have leads, but we're, Marcy and I are working on ways that we can actually disaggregate this and have this data available with the elementary. So a form goes out to all the leads at the secondary schools. Uh, next slide, I'm so sorry. And um, it basically asked four things. After the common assessment went out and the grading window was over, which assessment was it? So if you're at NFA, you're gonna give me algebra one, algebra two, and geometry. Where were the areas of success the teacher teams are discussing? Where are the areas of concern? Based on our assessments analysis and discussion, we will support the areas of concern by implementing the following action steps. So these are teacher teams discussing this and coming up with action plans for their own buildings. And we're, um, we're um, I rolled this one out for the second quarter, so I've yet to get it back. Were the action steps you provided last quarter successful and why? So this came back to me and some, uh, next slide please. These are just some quick examples of what the teachers came up with, which echoes the extended response conundrum that we were speaking about before. So NFA Maine stated that for problems that asked to explain, students often did not write anything. Um, Heritage said extended response questions, students demonstrated mathematical knowledge, but could not properly answer the question. NFA West stated uh, taking tests, especially with short extended response questions. You get the picture. This was echoed in what the teacher teams are seeing as well. So they are noticing themselves without me saying it, that these are the issues because the common assessments mirror the state assessments, but in a much condensed form. So taking that, we're all talking about the same thing. So really we're trying to get these students exposed more to the extended response questions and in ways that we can actually help mm -hmm. support with the reading and the strategies that we can do. Okay, and if I have a moment, I can just talk about we are rolling, we're in the process of getting a new K to five or K to eight program. Um, our current program is no longer supporting the next generation standards. So we have to move on to something that's a little more sustainable. We're looking for a program that's aligned to next gen, multilingual, <laughs> high rigor, again, uh, sustainable, like I mentioned, with differentiated approaches, an online component, and also family access, mom and dad, or whomever can go in and check on students' progress. The next step is we're identifying three programs that meet this criteria, and we're gonna bring it to the committee for a potential pilot. Uh, you're gonna get input from teachers. Yes. I just wanna make sure, because sometimes things happen and it's good to get input from teachers so yes. that's why i'm asking we're already doing it. okay thank you any questions or comments thank you thank you so much okay and our last uh update is re pertaining to the literacy audit um so we will be the district uh in collaboration with ulster boses and other external partners will be conducting a literacy audit grades k through eight um, where they'll be looking at our units of study, our scope and, our scope and sequence, our resources um, to identify if we in fact have all of the components and, and the pieces that our students need to learn and that meets their needs and their learning styles. So primarily the schools that will participate are Vales Gate, Bonville, Heritage Middle School, and Meadow Hill. So you have two elementary schools, a TSI and a CSI, a middle school and a K-8 building. Um, the first focus group meeting with Ulster BOCES will um, start on Friday, and that will be uh, the group of individuals who are still in the district that were here um, at the onset of uh, Erla and Anil and participated in um, the committee to bring that to the district. So the, we'll be gathering those results um, by March 17th with a full report. Um, it's also been requested that there are opportunities for teachers to provide feedback um, in other schools uh, to CNI, to the district, uh, specifically pertaining to ARC and the literacy needs. So um, we are going to create a survey and make it public to any teacher in grades K through eight who would like to participate in a focus group with the external uh, providers of the audit or uh, Dr. Farrell and myself. I have a couple of questions. 
um should be ordered wait until after the test scores come out because wouldn't that be more accurate in terms of them giving them a better broadside of what's going on should this not wait until after the test scores come out the audit i would suggest that the test scores can be added to the audit work but if we start the audit work now we'll be able to lay a more careful foundation for any potential changes if there are any to the work we do and then the scores can um, inform the work that the audit committee would okay because i'm just now. thinking test scores should be mm -hmm. involved with that yes, audit they should. yeah agreed and, and timeline get ready for september okay and on the, the second one you said it was going to be a full focus group for on um, the teachers um i thought that they were going to go into the buildings and speak with the teachers so instead you decided to do a survey instead no in addition to all of those other things oh, oh okay yeah. in addition i didn't i didn't well, hear three that three of those are like their separate own items another okay. layer another yeah. layer oh okay the survey Alrighty. is really in-house we've been doing them at mm -hmm. least two sometimes three times a year over the last few years okay. that's really to inform our specific practice and get the one-to-one -one feedback that's not part of the survey oh okay uh, are not part of the audit. not part of the, the the but i'm saying um with the with you guys going out to speak to teachers in different buildings that's what I kind of got confused when you said a survey because I didn't think it was going to be a survey. I thought you guys were going to go out to the building. So we're always out in the buildings. We're okay. going to put it out to principals if they want us to come to their PLC or open okay. invitation to teachers. A survey is another way to get people to communicate if they don't want us to. Oh, okay. All right. Provided by the feedback. Okay, thank you. I thought it would be a good initiative. And that concludes our agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Right on time, 3.31. Good, my palpitations have stepped on. <laughs> <laughs> okay.